Shalom, shalom. I am Moray Amir Ryder, Moray of Torah Culture Assembly. And today I will be continuing uh, with the lesson that I started on a couple weeks ago uh, on the topic of polygyny. So today we are entering uh, part two in this series, uh, The Truth About Polygyny, Examining History is what we're doing today. So last, uh, last lesson, I, uh, I dove into the scriptures and uh, addressed some, some points on pol- polygyny that's, you know, not, not typically addressed. Um, I didn't want to be the dead horse and say the same thing that everybody else said. Um, so I tried to present a different perspective for those who are actually interested in a different perspective, for those who want truth. Once again, this lesson is for those who are seeking the truth, not seeking to be right. We're not justifying um, your biases. This is just what it is. Um, let's remove the emotions. Uh, let's remove our let's remove our preconceived notions, um, and let's just see what uh, what the text says, or as today what history says. So, uh, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started because I got a lot to cover today. So, with that being said, we're gonna start with this point: the problem with the polygyny doctrine. All right. So let me repeat that: the problem with the polygyny doctrine. So the problem with it is. Uh, with the polygyny doctrine actually lies in doctrine itself not the polygyny doctrine the problem with the polygyny doctrine lies in doctrine itself not polygyny because with doctrine people become emotionally invested especially if they have uh, if they're in the public or they've gone on uh, on record uh, and with a specific stance it makes it much harder for them to actually see uh, truth and be able to uh, be intellectually honest about what something is or what something is really saying because their their emotions are involved it's easy to allow emotions to facilitate a narrative that coincides with opinionated doctrine it feels good uh, to say uh, when a loved one dies that they are up in heaven if you look at the scriptures, we know that this isn't the case. But their desire is to believe that someone they cared for is in a better place. And so that desire, that emotion feeds into their doctrine. So this is partially the reason why people accept the current yet inaccurate heaven and hell doctrine. It's partially to, uh, to blame. Hollywood has a lot to do with that as well. But emotions have to do with that also. I remember I had a conversation with someone and, and we were talking about heaven and hell. This was a man. I mean, he he was like, I just can't see uh, a loving God allowing someone to go to hell. So he believed that all people went to heaven. And that's an emotionally infused doctrine that he now uh, subscribes to that he conjured up because he couldn't in his emotional state understand why certain things happen versus just seeing what the scripture says because he abided by the scriptures. You know, this, this wasn't uh, a so-called non-believer. Uh, but this is someone who said that they believe the Bible, but even still, they allowed their emotions to carry them into a stratosphere uh, conducive for that type of belief that's not prevalent in the scriptures. So that's an emotional doctrine. So when you look at polygyny as a doctrine, regardless of what side you're on, uh, your personal biases show up simply in how you communicate about it. All right. So. Once again, if you approach it as doctrine, your personal biases, regardless of what side of the equation you are on, will show up simply in how you communicate about it. Uh, when you look at polygyny from a doctrinal perspective, our own biases and motives can cause us to interpret uh, via eisegesis uh, and read into the text what we wanted to say or what we we feel it's saying versus what it is actually saying and so i'm officially on record right now if i haven't done it before i'm officially on record stating that i do not subscribe to a polygyny doctrine i do not subscribe to a polygyny doctrine i subscribe to a polygynous culture i'm gonna say that one more time i am officially on record stating that I do not subscribe to a polygynous doctrine. I subscribe to a polygynous culture. So this is one of the reasons I've been so adamant about culture, even well before I was more aware of Torah Culture Assembly. Because when you understand culture, you understand that doctrine is relegated beneath the culture and doctrine must be in line with what the culture, mindset, and environment 
of that people of how they lived and in this instance the writers of uh, the bible uh, our, our ancestors who penned our cultural literature our sacred texts so so uh, for an example of how doctrine gets out of control all right i personally do not take anyone serious who debates on any calendar or calendrical system based off any phase of moon or any ancient writing that they found if if they leave out one central yet critical element and that element is agriculture specifically the harvest seasons the feast days are not doctrinal that's something that we did we made it doctrinal the feast days are not doctrinal they are an agrarian benchmarker within the Israelite culture. Our lack of understanding made it doctrinal. The feast days are designated around the harvest of the crops, not the other way around. So let me make this clear. When you grow food and you harvest said food, you end up with a lot of available food. What should an agrarian people do with all of this food? Look around. Let's have a feast. This becomes clearer when you realize that every agrarian culture has a harvest feast. It's not just Israel. It's not. So if your calendrical doctrine omits agri agricultures, uh, that teacher isn't worth listening to on that particular subject. I'm not addressing anything else, but at least in this particular case, if their doctrine is not in line with agriculture then for that topic they're actually not worth worth listening to it must line up with the harvest seasons at a minimum consider how important this is if the creator will have given a command to keep a feast where they bring a portion from their harvest in the dead season so we're talking about uh, in the late fall and winter this is the dead season so if the, if the creator commanded them to keep a feast where they bring food from their harvest at that time, then the creator himself would essentially be setting them up to fail because it would not be in accordance with natural law, seed, time, and harvest. You see what I'm saying? So, so you, you, don't, you don't harvest wheat in the dead of winter. So he tells the men that three times a year you must appear before Yahuwah and, and don't show up empty handed. That's because these three times of the year were harvest seasons. You have early spring, late spring, and early fall. These were harvest seasons. The former and latter rain makes much more sense when you fully understand the agricultural setting. Seed time and harvest as well. So the creator who is sovereign, he makes sense. So how much sense would it make to birth a nation from a polygynous man take this people that who come from him say to them he wants them to be a light to the nations to attract them to live like them give them a moral compass with a modified code of instructions or, or excuse me a moral compass with uh, codified instructions yet finds fault within a custom that he governs within this codified set of instructions make it make sense it, it won't make sense the problem is we haven't investigated the root of our disposition towards polygyny with the same vigor and ferocity as we investigated as we investigated Christmas. We haven't done that. Truth is, most people who are anti-polygyny don't want to know. They don't want to know. Because accountability takes place and responsibility takes place. You have to be much more responsible. But the problem is just like that Christian that frustrates you because he or she won't read or look up the origins of what they believe. Many of you have taken the same approach with polygyny and you attempt to defend something you know very little about. Cognitive dissonance, dissonance doesn't just apply to holidays and Sunday church services. So who taught you how to think? Who taught you what to think? I know it, 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 it sounds good to believe that, you know, our thoughts are, are independent of any outside influence and that we're our own people, um, you know, especially after you become quote unquote woke, you know, but s still there are, are influences throughout time, the time of your life that has influenced you. 
a lot of us don't know how much we are like our parents. Some, some people unfortunately grew up without a father in the house and don't really understand that they are just like their father. They don't understand this because their father isn't there. Like that's genetic code. You are your father. So a lot of people, you know, I, I would never be like my dad, but don't really fully understand because they haven't had the opportunity to talk to their dad about his life. They don't fully understand how much they parallel that. So just think of, 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 of hundreds or thousands of years of, of oppression over the process of time. What does your mindset come from? Your current understanding. What things over the process of time has influenced your understanding or, and influenced you to process information the way you do? What things over the process of time has caused you to develop the worldview that you have and to live out said worldview unashamed? Is it of independent origin? Or is it from somewhere else? So what does it mean to come out? Uh, we say a lot of stuff because it sounds good, but we don't really get it. Uh, come out from among her. Does that mean just stop tithing and leave the church? Does that mean uh, don't listen to uh, secular music? Does that mean trading your regular, sh- uh, your regular t-shirts for t-shirts with fringes? Does that mean grab a hair wrap or tunic? Go to church on Sunday instead of, uh, excuse me, go to church on Saturday instead of Sunday? Now, there's nothing wrong with these things in and of itself, but that doesn't even scratch the surface. See, as, as a man, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your actions are the manifestations of your thoughts. The things that proceed out of the mouth comes from where? It comes from the heart. And I will submit to you, I will submit to you today that many of you still have a heart of the Romans with a mind of the Greeks do my best to prove that you have not pinpointed why your heart is for and against certain things understand that rome was influenced by greece but rome essentially took over and influenced the entire world so you may hear me say uh, it's traced back to rome and that may simply be because they got it from the greeks and propagated it yet and still you are under the influence of a mighty drug and you have a Greco-Roman addiction. All right. All roads lead to Rome. So I'm going to repeat that because it's very, very important that that registers, that you digest that. All roads lead to Rome. Now, I know we've heard this at some point of our lives. Uh, if you're an adult, I'm sure you've heard this, uh, this uh, idiomatic expression. But I'm not necessarily talking about the idiomatic uh, expression as in the reality that exists throughout history. All right. And is, uh, Israelites hostility towards polygyny is stemmed, I believe, it's stemmed from the very mind of the Greeks and Romans, especially Rome. And I don't say that uh, with a con- in a condescending or derogatory way. It's just the reality that when you trace back the history all roads lead to Rome. All right. So let's let's begin to get into the uh, the actual meat of the lesson. Um, our three branches of government. Where did it come from? Have we ever considered that? Or did we thought that was uh, isolated strictly to America? Well, if you look into how the Roman government was organized, the Romans did not want uh, one man to make all the laws. All right. So they decided to balance the power. And what did they do to balance this power? They created three branches of government. It may sound a bit familiar to you um, because they are called the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Uh, I'm not going to get into what these things do because you should have already learned these things. It's here in America. It was there in Rome. So I'm not going to get into it. If you want to be familiar with what these things do, Uh, Go ahead and and do your research on these three branches. I wouldn't even call that research. Just Google it. Like that's not that that doesn't even qualify to be called research. Just Google what the executive, legislative, and judicial branch do. But then you can also, if you feel like uh, fact checking me, you can also find out where that originates from, and you will find out that it comes from Rome. We look about when you look into the Senate. Uh, So I looked into the Senate, and it says that it is a legal and administrative body of ancient Rome. I think this is the etymology of the Senate that I have on the screen right here. 
um, the legal and administrative body of where? Ancient Rome. Now, don't we have something called a Senate? Oh, that sounds familiar. Um, so I'm not even going to read all of this. Uh, it's the highest council of the state in ancient Rome, literally council of elders. This was the Senate in Rome. This was the Senate in Rome. And when you look into democracy, you look into voting, campaigning, magistrates, magistrates, these things all come from Rome. All you got to do is look into it yourself. We are already well aware that a lot of uh, the government architecture is inspired by Rome. We, we already see that. Uh, I, there's no debate on that. Um, it's, it's interesting because even Rome, from where my research has led me, Rome was the first to form a type. All right? It's not an apples to apples comparison, but they were the first to form a type of an electoral college. And although it wasn't called that, the operation of the Electoral College was very similar to the Electoral College that we have here. It just went by a different name. So our governmental system is really predicated off of how Rome operated. Our government buildings are designed off of Roman agriculture. So I start, I start looking into some more stuff. And, um, and so... Um, I'm going to read this to you. So this is not my words. This is um, I, f I don't even remember what side was look, so many different uh, sites. So I apologize for not having a source here. Um, but it says while Roman literature had a deep impact on the rest of the world, it is important to note the impact that the Roman language has had on the Western ro world. Ancient Romans spoke Latin which spread throughout the world with the increase of Roman political power. Latin became the basis for a group of languages referred to as the Romance languages. Uh, these include French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, Catalan. Uh, many Latin root words were also, or excuse me, are also the foundation for many English words. The English alphabet is based on the Latin alphabet or the Latin script. That's what it's really referred to as the Latin script. Along with that, a lot of Latin is still used in the present day justice system. So our language, our our language is influenced by Rome. Our um, our government is highly influenced by Rome. Our architecture is influenced by Rome. Uh, what else we have here? So this is from New Stanford Humanities Institute class, uh, and what they were doing is they was uh, examining the parallels. It's right here on the screen. They were examining the parallels between ancient Rome and the United States. I think everyone who uh, who are of Hebrew he, of Hebraic mindsets, right, who subscribe to being the Hebrews of the Bible, should do this because maybe this will help you truly begin to actually free yourself of a roman mind because we're walking around as hebrews but we're still wearing uh the the greek the greco-roman mindset that our spirit is still greco-roman it really is so from this article it stated that and i thought this was very interesting we wanted to offer a course that showed why the classical past is still so important for us to understand today Winterer said, ancient Rome isn't dead. It's alive and well and continues to shape the way we think about our world today, often in subtle ways that we don't see unless we know where and how to look. All right, so that was the professor there who is also the director of Stanford Humanities Center. Um, many modern societies have borrowed some aspect of ancient Roman thought, but its shaping influence on the United States has been especially profound. The framers of the United States Constitution incorporated Roman ideas uh, and about the separation of powers and the need for a Senate. They fluted white column, excuse me, the fluted white columns decorating the neoclassical facades. Uh, of many antebellum American plantation mansions mimic those of Roman temples. 
what I want to highlight is where they say ancient Rome isn't dead. It's alive and well and continues to shape the way we think about our world today, often in subtle ways that we don't see unless we know how and where to look. That is extremely important because that's the whole point. What I'm trying that's the whole point of what I'm trying to convey to you right now. That the origins of why you are so anti polygyny does not come from your African Shemitic background, from your Hebrew Israelite background. It doesn't come from there. You don't just feel that is wrong. It's been passed down for millennia. A couple millennia. It's been passed down. You are just propagating Roman thoughts. But we're going to continue. I'm not going to stop here. There's a lot more I have to bring out. We're going to continue. But you're just propagating Roman thought. So, the Roman influence is prevalent uh, in the United States. Rome has influenced American government, American entertainment, American architecture, uh, American language, American laws, American science, absolutely American religion, American culture, So if if Rome has influenced all of these things, are we going to be so arrogant to believe that Rome could not have influenced marriage and relationships? Are we going to be so arrogant to actually sit up here and believe that? Even when we look into just some of the words, you know, romantic, romance, romanticize. Our concept of romance and what's romantic comes from Rome. It's a Western way of thinking. Now, we know that it's Western. We know that because we we throw out that Western, Western, Western thought stuff a lot. But it's true. It's true. But where does it originate? It doesn't originate in America. The thought... The thought, the the essence, the beginning, the foundation comes from Rome. American thought, it may have shaped it a little bit to become what we see it now, to give it a a life of its own. But the foundation, uh, or or should I say the, the DNA of it comes from Rome. It comes from Rome. So organized religion has affected us and, um, you know, that's one of the things that I pointed out on that list is that that's one of the things that Rome influenced was American religion. Now, of course, American religion uh, is primarily Christianity, right? That's the biggest thing we have. Um, but let's not get it twisted. Uh, most of us are educated enough to know that Christianity and Catholicism, uh, they are one and the, one the same. They're not identical, but they are one and the same. They're clearly related. They're clearly from the same family. All right. Clear. It's very, very clear. Uh, The effects of organized religion has been uh, devastating on the Hebrew uh, people. Devastating on the Hebrew people. Uh, I talk about this in one of my other lessons that is called the effects of organized religion. So check that out if you want want, uh, more analysis on that. But one of the things I did mention in that lesson was how it eliminated Hebrew culture. So through missionaries and colonization, religion has caused the he caused Hebrew men and women to deny their heritage, their custom, uh, their culture, and even caused them to lose sight of the significance of even having these things under the guise of doctrine, proposing that there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. And that everyone is the same in Christ, while all others simultaneously keep their heritage and practice Christianity. But it was it it removed our heritage. It removed our culture. It removed our ties to our customs. And now we look upon them and we frown about them. Organized religion is what called our culture. uh, What's the word? Pagan. I'm going to have to readdress this because if you look at where the term pagan comes from, once again, that comes from those Catholic missionaries. That comes from those Christian Catholic missionaries and how they look at an indigenous people. And the, the customs of an indigenous people looks like 
witchcraft to them or they don't understand it so in numbers and i gave this uh, before but if you look at numbers when they talk about the uh the law of jealousy so if a man suspects his wife of uh of of committing adultery and the and the concoction that they have to make in the in the procedure that they have to carry out the ritual that has to be performed it is a ritual something like that will be looked at as voodoo it would be looked at as witchcraft it would be looked at as if we are an abomination of people and we need to be subjugated because we need the christian religion that's how they view torah that's how they view torah the leaders who have propagated organized religion specifically through catholicism and christianity uh, that's how they were viewed. So when they go to these places, they're looking down on the culture as if it is beneath them, that it is a lower culture, right? So we now do the same thing. We now do it. The vehicle used to shape the world in this consciousness was the Roman religion. The Roman religion was and is Catholicism, and this religion was imposed on indigenous, melanated beings across the world, especially the Hebrew people. Through, con- excuse me, through uh, conquest, forced conversion, the transatlantic slave trade, the Hebrew people have been subjugated to take on the religion of its oppressor, uh, and, and, and we have been subjugated to take on the mind of the oppressor. All you have to do is look at the scriptures, and anytime you see us go into any form of captivity, you see we leave out of that captivity with traces of our captors on us. It doesn't matter which one. We leave out of that captivity with traces of our captors upon us. This is no different. So here we go. Um, so to be of an orthodox religion, um, this means... The definitions are on the screen. To be of an orthodox religion, it is uh, relating to or conforming to the approved form of any doctrine, philosophy, ideology, etc. Of relating to or conforming to beliefs, attitudes, or modes of conduct that are generally approved. Uh, sound or correct in opinion or doctrine, especially theological or religious doctrine. That is the orthodox view right so if you're orthodox you will agree with the approved standard of doctrine uh the heretics the heretics or those who uh participate in heresy are those uh with and it reads an opinion opinion or doctrine at variance with the orthodox or accepted doctrine especially of a church or religious system look at this heresy Roman Catholic Church, the willful and persistent rejection of any article of faith by a baptized member of the church. That is going to be key as we move on. Once again, the vehicle that have propagated our train of thought comes from the Roman Catholic Church. It comes from Rome. Any belief or theory that is strongly at variance with established beliefs, customs, etc. So I'm going to ask you as we get into the meat of this lesson, is Rome still influencing you? Roman, uh, Rome, uh, via the Roman Catholic Church, changed the Ten Commandments. If you have not looked into this, I would recommend you do so just for uh, edification purposes. Uh, anyone who is bold enough to change the Ten Commandments and, and, and no one called them out on it is a very, very powerful organization. I just want to tell you that right now. If you look at this, it may look like, oh, there's nothing wrong. But the problem is that they removed the Third Commandment and it's... It's very interesting because the third commandment is about uh, idolatry. And we know that the Roman Catholic Church is very big on idolatry. So they remove the third commandment altogether. And then they split up the tenth commandment to make it nine and ten so that you can still have ten. Any any organization that will do something like that is a very powerful organization. Uh, so so this is what understand what I'm about to tell you here. When you weaponize doctrine, sin will become whatever the armed force says it is. When you weaponize doctrine, sin will become whatever the armed force says it is. All right. And the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it, had weaponized doctrine. Here we go. Louisiana's Code North 1724. So um, to regulate relations between slaves and colonists, the Louisiana Code North or Slave Code 
based largely on that compiled in 1685 for the French Caribbean colonies was introduced in 1724 and remained in force until the United States took possession of Louisiana in 1803. So what, what this essentially is, is a modus operandi. That is a mode of operation for handling slaves when they receive them. Um, this is not the entire list, but this is the ones pertinent to what I want you to understand today. This is what's important to the topic that is at hand. So we're just going to start at number two. It says, makes it imperative. These were laws. Makes it imperative on masters to impart religious instruction to their slaves. That was mandatory. If you're going to have slaves, you have to impart the religious instruction to them. What is religious instruction? Doctrine. Permits the exercise of the Roman Catholic creed only. Every other mode of worship is prohibited. Let me read that again. Permits the exercise of the Roman Catholic creed only. Every other mode of worship is prohibited. Number four. Negroes placed under the direction of supervision of any other person than a Catholic are liable to confiscation. So if they were not a Catholic, then that slave would be taken, could be taken. So this is laying the groundwork of seeing how all the way here in America that that Roman uh, system was begin to be imparted here okay so let's continue let's follow this train of thought so here we are with the list of heresies uh and this is from the book the inquisition revealed uh it's a pretty old book um but remember when i said if you weaponize doctrine sin becomes whatever the armed force says it is this is the roman catholic church this is the first time but this is an example of the Roman Catholic Church weaponizing doctrine and creating an uh, uh, identifying marker for what they describe as sin. So it, it's, it's 16 on this list right here. Um, I'm going to read them real quickly. You got heretics, open and secret heretics, schismatics, uh, receivers or favorers of heretics, hinderers of the office of the Inquisition, suspected heretics, persons defamed for heresy. This is pretty redundant at this, por at this point. Uh, we're at seven, and, and, and this is really covering just heretics. You got a relapsed person, uh, readers of prohibited books. You got number 10, those not priests administrating the Lord's Supper. 11, priests soliciting in confession. 12, blasphemers. 13, diviners and fortune tellers. 14, witches and wizards. 15, polygamists. 16, Jews and Jewish proselytes. That is Jewish converts. So you mean to tell me that Jews were as, as, was as bad as witches and wizards? Polygamist was as bad as uh, witches and wizards. They are ascribing or they are creating what is sin because they are in control of the doctrine. So, what happens if you subscribe to any of those things? Let's find out. Same book, The Inquisition Revealed. Um, this is the this is highlighting point 15 polygamous those who marry two or more wives are suspected of heresy and of disregarding the sacrament of matrimony such are punished with penances fasting and slavery in the galleys for five seven or ten years this crime is but lightly considered in spain though it is looked upon as more serious by the inquisitors in rome looked as more serious by the inquisitors in Rome. This is the same Roman religion that was imposed upon your more recent uh, grandparents, your, your maybe your, your great great grandparents who are in slavery. These, this, this is the mindset that was being projected upon them to view polygamy or polygyny you know they always say polygamy polygyny as such a thing let's continue the history of the council of trent 1676 
The 2 and 20th chapter mentioned that some inquisitors to extend their jurisdiction pretended that the offense of having two wives did belong to their office, who do allege for reason that it is an abuse of matrimony, which is a sacrament, and that in Spain the case is reserved to the office of the inquisition. Contrary is the common opinion of civilians who seeing the laws have imposed no punishment on this offense and the canon laws do not speak of it, they conclude by necessary consequence that it belongs to the secular jurisdiction. And this is observed in all tribunals, also in the state of Mil Milan where the Inquisition has more extended her authority than any other place in Italy, the reason brought to the contrary that it is an abuse of the sacrament of matrimony concluded nothing for the first wife taken in true matrimony so I'm gonna skip down a little bit and if anyone would make having two wives a token of heresy inferring that they do believe it to be lawful with this reason he might draw all cases to the inquisition for it may as well be said that the adulterer or the thief do commit those wickednesses believing that they are lawful things and among the rest we should put into the inquisition all gypsies who get their life by stealing and much more your highway robbers but contrary wife we must always suppose that every sinner has a true belief and catholic catholic doctrine but do sin either through frailty or through malice or through humane compassion and so ought to be punished by his ordinary judge which ought also to be observed in him that has two wives if there appear no other token of a perverse belief and it is not true that in spain the case is absolutely reserved to the inquisition yea it is ordinarily punished by the secular by branding in the forehead with a hot iron but because the Jews and Moors hold plurality of wives to be lawful, those who are of Jewish or Moorish races are examined at the Inquisition for the supposed, excuse me, for the su uh, suspicion of heresy and punished with branding for the offense. Let me read that again. But because the Jews and Moors hold plurality of wives to be lawful those who are of jewish or moorish race are examined at the inquisition for the suspicion of heresy and punished with the branding for the offense if a turk or jew become christian be found to have two wives he may be tried in the inquisition for his suspected belief and for the offense in the ordinary court of justice so this shows that uh that throughout history uh, jews and and here they also put moors uh hold to plurality of wives so this was not just something that ended once the messiah came as some people attempt to uh to to claim which i'm going to go into uh, on my next lesson but it, it never it never ceased because it was never sin and it was truly part of their culture but it was not a part of roman culture and we're going to really get into the beginning of that uh, but right here i wanted to once again uh, show you that through religion many people today many hebrew people today view polygyny with such a negative light because it was embedded in them to do so it was embedded in them to do so by their oppressor. But let's continue. The history of the Inquisition. And this reads, Polygamists are those who marry several wives at once. The tribunal of the Inquisitors take cognizance of their cause because they are suspected of heresy and are presumed to think wrong concerning the sacrament of matrimony and to hold the lawful to have several wives at once. When a polygamist is in the jails of the holy office and he is known to be the self-same person either by confession or by witnesses and when his crime is proved he is asked whether he truly believes it is and has been lawful for a christian man after the evangelic law to marry several wives at once 
If he answers affirmatively, he is taken for a formal heretic and is to be punished as such. But if he answers negatively and, like a Catholic, denying that he had any heretical intention but was rather enticed to a second matrimony by the lust and concupiscence of the flesh, he must be put to the torture concerning his intention that the judges of the faith may certify themselves what the polygamist truly thinks concerning the faith. Because the crime of heresy is secret and lies, in, lies hid in the mind. This is peculiar to this holy office, though according to the laws of it, they rightly apply the torture. For since the fact which the criminal confesses or of which he is convicted may be committed without any error of the mind, but for, but for some other cause, for instance, concupiscence, the criminal is tortured concerning his intention and belief of those things which he has done so now we're starting to see the pattern that uh, polygyny was not outlawed by the creator it was not outlawed by uh, the messiah it was outlawed by rome um, and the roman catholic church so right now we were just focusing on the church to show you how this has affected us to the, today because our ancestors were slaves we saw uh, as I pointed out, what the rules were was to uh, institute Catholic doctrine into the slaves. That's what's supposed to have been taught, was Catholic doctrine to the slaves. And so, uh, so this was the Roman Catholic Church, but now we're about to go back a little more and just get into Rome in general and see what does history state about Rome in general uh, concerning monogamy and polygyny. All right.